Good evening. It's good to see all of you. It's hard to preach after that worship session. I just kind of want to say, keep growling. Like, let's not stop here. You guys are doing brilliant. Thank you, Tisa. I really appreciated that. You can clap like it's good. It's brilliant. Josh, you were brilliant as well. Really enjoyed all of that. My name's Adam, for those of you who don't know me. And we will be finishing up the book of Exodus tonight. Let's be honest, it's a short version of Exodus. This could be about a four-year preaching series. And tonight we're going to finish it up. So there's about five chapters, so I want to get into it. But the, the thing about the book of Exodus, which we've found, is that the book of Exodus points to Jesus. And so we get the big idea for the end of the book from that. The book of Exodus points us to a greater Exodus. The death and the resurrection of Jesus. In fact, everything that we've learned over the past however many weeks we've been in Exodus has pointed us to Jesus. If we remember correctly, we were the Israelites that were trapped by the Egyptians. We were enslaved. But God being rich in mercy freed us. We saw the plagues as God defeated our idols. We saw our salvation in the Passover. The blood of the Lamb which pointed us to a greater blood. We saw the promise of the covenant over and over and over again. I will free you from your sins and I will bring you to a land of milk and honey. Trust in me. And we saw worship. We saw just as we worship, Israel worshiped. And then we saw fall like we see in our lives. See, it looks an awful lot like the Christian life to me as we walked through the book of Exodus. I found particular comfort as they were creating this calf and having to melt it down and drink it. Just how much my idols seem to, you know, go in and come out of my mouth. It was just the other day I came to pick up my son from the uh, babysitter Great babysitters, by the way. You may know them, the Masseys. And I came in, and he was jumping on their couch like a wild person, like a savage. And I thought, this is going to be fantastic. I'm going to walk in, and he's going to run up to me and embrace me. And he ran away. <laughs> and the idols came pouring out of my mouth. And so it, I find it interesting that as we finish up the book of Exodus, we also start off our missional communities. Yeah, we can, we can woo that. Joy box? <laughs> missional communities? All right. You're alive. I didn't even have to ask today. That's fantastic. Because the reality is, is, is the book of Exodus shows us our life as Christians, and as we continue to go over and over and over again, it's God shaping his people to be a people of worship. And so I have a few questions for us as we go to venture out as God's people in our missional communities for us today. We'll be in Exodus chapter 33, and we'll start in verse 17. The question I have for us is will we be desperate for God's presence or will we depend on ourselves? Will we be desperate for God's presence or will we depend on ourselves and our Christian walk? In verse 17, the Lord says this to Moses, This very thing that you have spoken I will do for you have found favor in my sight, 
and I know you by name. And verse 18, Moses said, please show me your glory. And so as I was pondering this particular passage, I came to, to think about what does it mean that we have the favor of God And so I started to think in my life, what are the, the th people that I want favor from? Where are the things that I derive that, that comfort from? And I thought, of, and I thought you know what? I, I really want to have favor with my father, my biological father. It means a great deal that he's proud, to, proud of me, that he finds favor. And when he's not proud of me, then it hurts my emotional being. I thought I want to find favor at work. I want people to know who I am, to know what I do. When I was an athlete, I wanted to find favor with the coaches. I wanted them to know me and know my accomplishments. In the military, depending on which phase, some days you just wanted to meld in and not have any favor, like I'm no name. But other days you really wanted to be known. And so I found favor in Mac, the squadron commander. And what I found in this versioning of, of who I wanted to find favor was, is that I respected each one of those men. Each one of them. And so we have to ask ourselves, does it matter that we have, that God has seen us as favorable. Because the reality, church, is if God is not God, if God is some esoteric being or just some figment in the clouds or a book that you read to your children to make them feel better, or if God is Santa Claus, or if God is anything but the Creator of all and the Lord of Lords and the one who matters most, this verse means nothing to you. Because an esoteric God that has found favor in you is powerless. And yet we just sang of the power and the glory of God. And not just that he's the most powerful being and, he, and that you found favor, that you become favorable to him. But he knows you by name. See, the reality, church, is, is in this world, the idea of being known by your name is one of the most intimate things you can think of. Let me put it to you this way. Throughout the course of my life, I've been known by a few things. True story. Some of you are thinking some of those names right now. But I know, I've been known as Adam. I've been known as Slogget. I've been known as, well, I'll let you just think of all the different nicknames that I've had. But in each one of those names held a relative identity. And I think it's this reason why when we find favor in all of the things that we start to see the fragmentation of our identity and we lose our identity in the one who matters most. For example, when I was in the military, my identity looked very different than it did now. There's a reality. Some of you have seen portions of that. When I was in high school, at a Catholic high school, my identity looked different than when I was at a public high school. When I moved from Colorado Springs to Castle Rock, then to Utah, I found myself being able to change my identity. And this is not, by any means, just my own story. 
If you start to think about through your life about all of the different experiences that you've had and the places that you've moved and the times that you've changed and on all of the different things that you've had, what you're going to find out is that your identity in reality is fractured. It doesn't take long to find out that those things that we find approval in ultimately start to shape who we are in that moment. In the military, Mac shaped me quite a bit. During my sports, my coaches shaped me quite a bit. During my schooling, I don't know, maybe a teacher shaped me here or there. I give a nod to the teachers in the room. When I came up on the city on a hill, many of you have shaped me. But if we think about this in a rational way, what we start to find is, is our identity is directly tied to our worship. See, if you found favor in your work or in your sports, in your career, in your spouse, in your lovely little son, what you find is, is your identity is often fragmented and fractured. But if you find your identity in the Lord Jesus, your response will be this. Please show me your glory. Because I've looked at all of the other idols and they have nothing but a bronze glory. And it can be melted down quickly. And it doesn't taste good. So the reality is, is we have a need that we cannot overlook. Chapter 33, verse 1, says this. The Lord said to Moses, Depart, go up from here, and you and the people whom I have brought you up into the land of Egypt, to the land of which I swore to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, saying to your offspring, I will give it. I will send an angel before you, and I will drive the Canaanites and the Amorites, and the Hittites and the Perizzites, and the Hivites and the Jebusites. Go up to a land flowing with milk and honey. Because the reality is, church, is that the world wants eternity. If we were all made in God's image, we bear the mark of, our, of eternity, per Solomon, on our hearts. We can see this in various writings all over the place, most like Indiana Jones, amen? Some of you are old enough to remember Indiana Jones. We have a need. We are a fragile people. We talked about how fragile our identities are. How fragile is our physicality? I was talking to Tim earlier today, and he told me that uh, eventually he's going to have to stop pastoring the church. And I said, homie, oh, you've got another 20 years in you. Like, what are you talking about? And he said, I'm going to need some miraculous healing. And I said, God does that. It's a good thing we're in this business. But the reality is, is that all of the, of the modern medicine that we've had and all of the genius that has come out of humanity and all of our efforts to make our lives better, we've only brought just a smidgen better than when we were 400 years ago. Just a smidgen. Our beautiful flu shots, 11% effective this year. Common colds, moms, how are we doing there? Oh, not so good, huh? So in our brilliance, in the human brilliance, our minds, the best minds in the world, we have barely accomplished a tiny bit of what Jesus did in three days. We are a fragile bun brun bunch. We are in desperate need of a Savior. And so all of humanity throughout all of the world 
has basically done nil but one. What about our emotional beings? Are we fragile there? Anybody fragile emotionally? Yeah. I see some head nods. The men are like, nope, not me. I don't know what you're talking about, emotions. I know as a, as a hardened individual as I am, it can take Taylor about 12 seconds to get me hurt, to hurt my feelings, to make me mad. She can, 12 seconds can bring me joy, or at least slight happiness. But if we start, no, she's not here. <laughs> but the reality is, is our emotional fragility is off the charts. All the days we can figure out all of the things that shift our emotions this way and that way and running all over the place. And yet we want to talk about eternity. And we see that in our Israelites, Israelites, right? When the Lord says to, to Moses, depart and go up from here, and you and the people who I brought you out of the land of Egypt and the land that I swore to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, saying, to your offspring I will give it, so it's not even going to be you, but I will send an angel before you, and I will drive out all of these ites. Now go up to a land of honey. Doesn't necessarily say we can do it well. We couldn't get out of Egypt. We couldn't even last 24 hours before we started complaining and whining. We definitely weren't getting past the Red Sea. And as soon as Moses goes up on the, the, the mountain, we build a calf out of some gold and start worshiping it. That's how absolutely fragile we are emotionally, spiritually, and physically. And so we have an absolute need that we cannot overlook. And we also have a privilege that we cannot neglect. Verse 11 in the same chapter says this, Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face, as a man speaks to his friend. When Moses turned again into the camp, his assistant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man would not depart from the tent. So if we as a church have a mission that's impossible, and our identities, and our emotions, and our physicality is weak, Where do we turn? See, in the rest of this chapter in Exodus, we see a, a building of the tabernacle. Three chapters worth, in fact, it goes on and on about the tabernacle and exactly how it was to be built and where it was going to go. And then it goes on to the robes of the priest and it has all of these interesting things. This is just so that the people could get to God and they needed specific people to go in and to pray for them and intercede. And then Jesus on the cross while He dies, the, the veil gets Torn and he's been giving you access. If we are a fragile people, if we are a people that is in desperate need of a Savior and we really have no idea what's going on, then why would we not turn to the one who created all things and to speak to him face to face? We spend our time reading various help books. We spend our time whining, complaining. We spend our time talking about how bad things are and how awful things are. And we spend our time on Facebook and on Twitter and on Instagram and on Snapchat and on all of these different things. But if we're on an impossible journey sent by God Himself and we're fragile and we're weak-minded and we will run to the most glorious pasture that will do nothing for us, why would we not stand in front of the throne room of God 
and plead our case. And this is the reality, church. We don't stand in front of the throne room of God and look at Him face to face as a man because just like Adam in the garden, we are hiding behind our fig leaves. When God looks at Adam and says, Adam, where are you? It was rhetorical. God knew where He was. God knew that he had eaten the apple. God knew that he was going to send a savior. God knew that this was going to happen. And when Adam comes out and he says, here I am, Lord. This is Adam saying, I'm dropping my pretense. I'm dropping all of these different identity fractures. I'm dropping all of these facades that I've created because I'm looking for adoration from all of these other things. I'm vulnerable, I'm weak, I'm here. And if you've been taught well, what you hear is, I'm here. This is Jesus saying, please come up onto my lap and hold my beard and look into my eyes. I stole that from a Canadian. It's a great line. I've written it down like 16 times, man. I love it. But that's the reality. Because in our humanity, we have been taught to shape shift and identify differently and put on masks and all of these other things. And that may work for a time where you work. That may work for a time with your spouse. That may work for a time in your church community. That may work for a very long time. But when you stand before the throne room of God, He knows who you are. And He knows what you've done. And just like the prodigal son, He's hiking up His robe and holding out His arms saying, Come to Me. Let there be a feast. But we have to be desperate for His presence not dependent on ourselves. We have to be known by God, not hiding with fig leaves. We have to be open and vulnerable. We have to allow people into our lives and open up our doors. We have to come to the foot of the cross And why do we have to come to the foot of the cross? Because we have an assignment that we cannot complete. Verse 16 of Exodus 33 says this, For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, Moses said to God, I and your people? Is it not in your going with us, so that we are distinct, I and your people, from every other people on the face of this earth. So as in, in his intercessory prayer, he says, you have to go with us. You have to be with us, God, because there's no way that that I and your people are going to look distinct without you. We will build a calf and we will worship the Nile and we will grab a pig and worship that or a cow or a chicken. In our lives, it will be our wives or our kids or our Ford trucks, our intellect or our books our job, or our status. We will go to worship anywhere and everywhere. But Moses is saying, how are we going to look different? How are we going to be distinct? And it starts with the precepts of what we talked about. We're going to be open, and we're going to be honest, and we're going to be vulnerable, and we're going to go to the cross, and we're going to look to the Father. 
We're going to read the word because we find that all of the things are shown in Jesus. The glory of God. We sang about it and we prayed about it. And in that, God is going to change our heart. The Spirit is moving and all of a sudden we start to speak differently and move differently and react differently. We become generous with our money, our time, our talents. People start to see the glory of God and His people. But we will not look distinct in this world if we don't come to the cross with a dependence. If we try to do anything without Jesus, we will look just like every other country club. And we will gossip. And we will tear each other apart. And we will hurt each other. We will be greedy with our time and our money. And unfortunately, this is what the church has looked like for so many years. My second question as we walk through this Christian journey is this. Will we long to see God's glory? Or have we seen enough? Chapter 35, 1-3 says this. Moses assembled all the congregation of the people of Israel and he said to them, These are the things that the Lord has commanded you to do. Six days work shall be done, but on the seventh day you shall Sabbath of solemn rest, holy to the Lord. Whoever does not work, whoever does any work on that shall be put to death. Uh Uh-oh. You shall kindle no fire in your dwelling place on the Sabbath day. So what I found in my Christian walk, and I think it probably rhymes with many of you, is that when someone comes to Christ, we use the terminology, they're on fire, which is interesting and kind of awkward anyway. I think of NFL Blitz or something like that. NBA Jam. I played it one time and it was ugly. Josh is laughing still. But you're on fire as a Christian. You want to you you read everything. You want to consume books of the Bible. You want to pray and you want to write down everything and every book you can get your hands on. That's what you grab. And then reality comes in and Life becomes mundane and pretty soon you're just going to church on Sundays and maybe, a turn, maybe attending a meal with your missional community that looks more just like a family that's gathered has missed out on mission. We see God's glory in our salvation In proper theology, we can't lose it. And maybe in our minds, that starts to tick in the back. What do you need to work for? Where do you need to find God's glory? You have all of these things, work and checklists and calendar items. And pretty soon we stop looking for God's glory. And so as God repeats himself on this little bit on the Sabbath, I was absolutely wrecked. See, if we take my first question, and am I dependent on God, or am I just out for it myself, and then I look to see if I long to see God's glory, and I read this passage of the Sabbath, I'm reminded that I rest poorly. I did go ice skating yesterday, and that was a blast. That was close to Sabbath for me. But this is the question that I asked myself while I was reading through this. I said, do I really want to see God's glory shine through me, or just me shine, and God cosigns 
on my greatness. And so I implore you, church, to rest well so that we can see God's glory in our Sabbathing. That we don't think that we have to do everything and move all of the boulders and take the mountain and get all of Arnold on the boat of of Jesus in every little second and every little moment of what we do and we forget that it was God who was going before us and God that was turning people's hearts and it was God that was empowering us and it was God doing all of the work. That we may rest in Him Because the world turns while you sleep. And sometimes we need to be Marys and not Marthas. Sometimes we need to sit at the feet of Jesus and long to see God's glory. Do I really want to see God's glory shine through me? Or just me shine. And God cosigns on my greatness. Psalm 17, 15 says this. I may get this tattooed on my eyelids. It says, As for me, I shall behold your face in righteousness. When I awake, I shall be satisfied with your likeness. Unbelievable. When you walk that down. As for me, I shall behold your face in righteousness. When I awake, I shall be satisfied with your likeness. So the third question I would ask today as we start to venture off in our missional communities is this. Timely, actually. Will we be faithful stewards or selfish consumers? Exodus 35, 29 says this, and this is after a long period of God telling everybody, look, you can bring everything. Your time, your talents, your gifts, all of that, it's all mine. And it says this. All the men and women, the people of Israel, whose heart moved them to bring anything for the work that the Lord has commanded by Moses to be done, brought it as a freewill offering to the Lord. Let me run it back one more time. All of the men... And the women, the people of Israel, that's us included, grafted by the Lord Jesus, whose hearts moved them to bring anything for the work of the Lord, had commanded by Moses to be done, brought it as a freewill offering to the Lord. Because the reality is, is when we start to look at our brokenness and our need for a Savior, and when we start to see that we can do absolutely nothing, and we peer upon His glory, and we get face to face with the Lord our God, and we start to say, it's not about my glory, but it's about His glory, the only thing that makes any sense of the in, in the entire world is an Isaiah 6 moment when God says, you are my chosen one. And Isaiah 6 says, look, I'm a woeful sinner, but send me. You are God, not me. It's your will, not mine. All of my things, they're all for you. And I will use them as such. If there's hungry, feed them. If there's naked, clothe them. If there's broken, give them the gospel. Love them. 
If someone needs a ride, give them the car. Give them the ride. This is the Acts 2 church. So clearly and evidently, But the caution here, church, is is if we do this out of selfish, reckless ambition, we will become disdainful for the church. The second the pastor starts preaching on any bit of money, we will just turn around and we will say, not today. For the millennials, that's not my pastor. Hashtag. The second it becomes about us, we will turn our face from God and we will run to the shiniest object that's nearest to us. But in Christ, in glorious worship, what we find is is that our trust and our, our reliance, not just emotionally, not just physically, but in the things that we have, our socioeconomic prowess now falls into His hands. And I earnestly believe that this is one of the largest downfalls of the church in the Western world. Is that we got caught so far up in the American dream that we could absolutely believe we could do everything and we can do anything. And if I got the money, it's because gosh darn it, I earned it. And I'm not giving it to you. But in God's economy, when God moves our hearts, we bring anything and everything as a free will offering to the joy box. Man, y'all are good. Still not doing it. So my fourth question and my final question today is this. Will we we remain amazed that God has tabernacled among us? Or will we grow cold to the good news? So at the very end of the book of Exodus, they build this incredibly ornate tabernacle full of various different robes for the priest cubits something to the effect of 24,000 pounds of gold what most historians believe what it took to build this bad boy it was immaculate it was perfect executed with precision and in Exodus 40 It's the last little bit of the book of Exodus. We read this. And then the cloud covered the tent of meeting. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud settled on it. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Throughout all their journeys, Whenever the cloud was not taken up, then they did not set out till the day it was taken up. For the cloud of the Lord was on the tabernacle by day, and fire was in it by night, in the sight of all of the house of Israel throughout all of their journeys. And so what we see here in this passage is that the Lord fills this tabernacle And it's the presence of the Lord in their encampment. They needed it to move, to be guided. It had to be a fairly amazing sight. For the cloud of the Lord was on the tabernacle, 2,400 pounds of gold by day, and the fire was in it by night. Can you imagine that spectacle? It was the most holy thing that they had. It was the presence of the Lord. And in its ornateness, we find the brilliance of Jesus. 
because it wasn't about the 2,400 pounds of gold or the cubits in which God had beautifully crafted it. What it points to ultimately is you. I think so often that the in Christianity that we forget that God knows every hair on our head that in your mother's womb he knitted you that he blew life into you he crafted you with his hands if we remember our creation story we're the only thing that he crafted that way And then his son came down from the heavenly places and took on a, a body like ours. Interestingly enough, we still don't know how the body works in so many facets. And he lived this 33 years of a sinless life. He was charged with a crime that he didn't commit. He was crucified. He died a death that we deserved for the sins that we committed. He was resurrected by the Spirit on the third day, bringing us life in Him. And then He imparted the Spirit of God into us. See, if we have an impossible mission and we're vulnerable and we're weak and we need a Savior, for a second if we forget that Jesus has tabernacled in us as a people, as a community, then we'll fail miserably. We'll fail in our identities as individuals. We will fail to love each other as a community. We will not go through the exodus of our own sins, being sanctified daily. God will eventually get His work done, but it will be painful and it will be hard. But the Lord Jesus lives inside of you. Are we amazed by this? by the grace that was given to us. That God the Creator lives in you. He empowers you. He speaks to you. That you can pray to Him face to face. That the cloud by day and the fire by night, the provisions in which God gave His people Israel now resides in you. Is that amazing to you? Or have we gone cold to that fact? My challenge today is that we start to recognize individually that we were created in God's image, beautifully woven together, unique, empowered by the Spirit, so that not only will we see His glory, but Arnold will see His glory, and that we will saturate our town with the love of Jesus. Because Jesus led the ultimate exodus through his death and his resurrection.